very much for sharing your opinion and which is great faith based on seeing or faith based on not seeing and most of you have said uh, faith, faith based on uh, faith that is based uh, sorry faith that is based not on not seeing uh, is uh, like it seems almost like a, a 60 plus percentage of uh, our, our people we people are thinking faith faith without seeing is greater than faith that is based on seeing I would like to comment on this later in the later part of my uh, sermon uh, this morning but I would like to go through uh, the study or to share some, some reflections on the same scripture passage we have read we have heard in the uh, worship uh, in the entire worship and some of those we have already sung also in the worship uh, so and uh, since we already know the story also since we know that scripture portion very well i'm not going to uh, read the scripture portion but i would like to make uh, a few reflections upon that if you look at, if you look at the bible all the gospels include some kind of narratives of the appearance of risen, Je risen jesus christ to his disciples and to various uh, other peoples and in these narratives we can see that the disciples were passing through a journey they were passing through a phase of doubt and a phase of unbelief they were passing through trouble they were passing through confusion and uh, astonishment and at last they arrive at the point of believing the truth and the truth is Jesus Christ has risen from the dead in the flesh. So, you know, in all the Gospels, there are some kind of narratives in which the risen Jesus Christ appeared himself to the people or manifested himself to his disciples. And if you, if you observe the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they did not give very serious or very so, I mean, they did not give so much of attention to uh, narrating the stories of the appearances of the uh, appearances of risen Jesus Christ in comparison to John, John, the author of the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have given one or max two incidents, but John, if you observe, he has written entirely two chapters. Two chapters of encounters uh, of disciples with the risen Jesus Christ. And not only that, an interesting thing is, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, they, did, they just mentioned the name Thomas in the list of the disciples and they did not give any other description. John, the twin. That's all. Who is his twin brother? That's also we do not know. Okay, nothing, no information. He is just part of the list of the disciples or the apostles. But John, he gives some interesting information about Thomas. And no other gospel that, that reveal the same. Since today we are going to study and look about Thomas, uh, that it is important for us to understand the character of Thomas as well. So the Gospels, other Matthew, Mark, Luke, they did not give information about Thomas. Information about Thomas only John gave, and there are two particular incidents which reveal the character of uh, Thomas. Number one is Thomas seems to be a very good listener, and he is a very sincere listener, and he is very truthful and courageous to ask questions. And where we can see that, we can see in John chapter 14, verse 5. Jesus said, I am going to the Father. I am going to prepare a place for all of you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I am going to prepare the place for you. And you know the way. And all the disciples were listening. I just wonder, I don't think that any of the disciples truly knew the way to the Father's heart or Father's house. Do you think the disciples knew? The way to the father's house but nobody were asking any question and they were listening as if they understood everything and they were listening as if they uh, they got the mysteries 
of the kingdom of God and they have secret access to Jesus' heart to understand every word. None of them were speaking a single word and simply nodding their heads as if they understood. But Thomas is the only one person. He said, oh, Jesus, you are saying, you are going to your father's place. Your father's place is supposed to be Nazareth. Okay, but which father you are talking about? Oh, wow, heavenly father. Oh, if it is heavenly father, how should, how will you go? And you said, you are saying that we also know the way and we don't know the way. We know the way to Nazareth, but not to the heavenly father. And he was sincerely listening to Jesus. That is the reason he was asking the question, Jesus, truly, I do not know what you are talking about. The disciples were simply nodding or sometimes they may not be even listening. <laughs> we all know in the classrooms and especially in churches also it happens. <laughs> we'll be listening to the preacher. Listening, they do not understand. But Thomas is the one who was sincerely listening to Jesus. Such a person he is. And another thing, another incident we can see is um, uh, another truth about Tom, Thomas is Thomas is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. That also we can find in John chapter 11 verse 16. Jesus said his friend Lazarus he passed away. And he said, we will go and raise him up from the dead. Okay. Then all the disciples, none of them spoke anything. As if they understood that Jesus is going to raise the dead person to life. Or even as if they understood that Jesus is able and capable to raise the dead from the life, uh, the people from the dead. But I don't think the disciples truly understood Jesus would raise the people from the dead or uh, Jesus, Jesus is uh, talking that we all will go and raise the dead from the dead, uh, Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Jesus said, they are listening, but nobody was serious about it. But we can find Thomas is the first person who come and says, okay, let us also, guys, let us also go with him and so that we may die with him. It looks like many a times, if you go with him, we will die. But that's not what Thomas is saying. Because in John chapter 10 itself, we can read, John chapter 10, Jesus was preaching and Jesus was teaching uh, in Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem and in the, in the region of Judea, where people picked up the stone to kill Jesus. Then he left that place and he was ministering beyond the Jordan. And from there, just few days ago only, they came to Jobia, region beyond the Jordan and they heard the news about Lazarus. And Jesus is saying, now we will go back to Lazarus which is Bethany, which is just three miles away from Jerusalem, which is full of religious Jews. Just the place where he was about to be stoned to death. And John, Thomas is the person, first person who has said, okay, we'll go along with Jesus. He is such a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we church have tagged him Another word which do not which does not describe his character, that is, we call him doubting Thomas. <laughs> doubting Thomas. Just because one single incident that is recorded by John in John chapter 20, which we have already read. But the character of John Thomas is he is a faithful listener, sincere listener, and faithful follower of Jesus Christ. We named him doubting Thomas because of this incident. That is also just because of one single statement Jesus made. Uh, that is, uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, blessed, uh, sorry, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, because, uh, sorry, because you have seen me, you believed. And then he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Just because of this single statement, we changed the character of Thomas completely and we made him a, a doubting Thomas. Even his life does not fit with this description because we all know what happened in the life of Thomas. He came to India as Manavali minded us and he died for the witness of Jesus Christ. He gave his life for Jesus. He was faithfully following. He said faithfully he will follow Jesus to death and he followed. And we call him as doubting Thomas. Okay. 
another thing we can find is as i said uh, keeping keeping at that uh, keeping at that aside we we'll come back to that later uh, as i said in all gospels there are some kind of narratives about the appearance of jesus christ but many you can find in john in matthew we can find appearance of jesus christ to the mary magdalene who went to the tomb with the spices and all to anoint the body of jesus christ and there he appeared to her and uh, he appeared to the disciples uh, sorry he asked the he asked mary magdalene Uh, to tell the disciples to come and meet him in galilee so probably disciples met him in galilee these are the two incidents we can find in matthew in mark we can find the incidents of mary magdalene and uh, we can uh, we can uh, we can get the inc- uh, sorry uh, incident of jesus appearing to two people who are going to the village side probably these are the people who are going to emmaus on the road to emmaus the same thing mentioned in luke jesus appeared to mary magdalene and on the road to emmaus and uh, uh we can we can find uh, the incidents like empty tomb uh, empty tomb in all these three and in john also empty tomb incident <coughs> is mentioned in the last week uh, i guess mano was leading the worship again and he was telling how jesus folded his clothes is a symbol of his coming and all this is the incident mentioned in john so jesus appeared to mary magdalene and folded napkins and all uh, what disciples have seen that is the encounter the disciples had about the uh, resurrected lord and then we can find uh, jesus enters into the closed room he walks through the walls and enters the closed closed room in jo- i'm sorry uh, that is uh, another uh, narrative we can find in john and then jesus enters into the closed room again that is when thomas is there these are the four incidents not just one four incidents john mentioned about the appearance of jesus christ before this thomas incident and even after that also john it speaks about two other incidents one is jesus appearing to uh, the disciples on the beach he spoke to them and jesus restores the peter john chapter 21 so these many incidents john was recording just to explain that the resurrected jesus met the disciples okay from this we understand there is something very significant john wanted to communicate and we can understand there is something very emergent in john's time that is the reason he is so very much forced <coughs> right all these incidents that is very important for us to understand as we are reading this scripture what is that so very important for john to communicate the appearance of the risen christ of jesus and to give such a dramatic narratives and one among them is jesus meeting uh, sorry thomas meeting with jesus what is that so very important the answer is this thomas even reveals the true nature of jesus christ and another point we can learn from this incident is uh, the relationship between faith by seeing or faith uh, without seeing okay so if you read this passage these are the two points we we can find that are very loudly coming out number 1 is J. John he wants to communicate and explain the nature of Jesus Christ through the encounter of Thomas with Jesus and second thing is faith by seeing and faith without seeing John's desire is to reveal the true nature of Jesus Christ if you look at the gospel of Jesus the gospel of John the gospel of John uses high christology theologically people use the word high christology which means John he explains so very much about the divinity of Jesus Christ in so high levels and the nature of Jesus in a high levels okay not in very anything low but in very high levels how for example Matthew is a Matthew started his gospel uh, writing the genealogy from Abraham Matthew started with Abraham story starts with Abraham and then mark with the ministry of jesus what all the miracles he had done he was casting out demons from there 
Mark started. Luke started the genealogy, the gospel, from the genealogy of Jesus Christ, starting from Adam. Look where they are going. They are going beginning for Matthew, beginning is Abraham. For Mark, beginning is the ministry of Jesus. For Luke, the beginning of humanity. But when it comes to John, he goes much, much further uh, into eternity past. And he writes, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Can you see the kind of... <coughs> The kind of importance and elevation John is giving to Jesus. These are just like the Telugu movie elevations to the heroes. Right? <laughs> and he is giving even greater elevation to Jesus. He is not someone from uh, the time of Abraham. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He is not someone from Adam. And he is even before the Adam. Even before God created any humanity or any creation. He is there. He is talking about all high Christology. And, and not only that, if you look at Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, the passion narratives are there. In the passion narratives of Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus was going through so much of tension the day before his crucifixion. And Luke, now he, Luke, he says that Jesus was sweating blood because he was so highly tensed. He was sweating blood. But you read in John, Jesus was not at all bothered and scared about his death. He was very courageous and he was more concerned about the disciples whom he is going to leave for a while. And he prays for them, John chapter 17. And he wanted to express his love completely, John chapter 14 verse 1, 13 verse 1. He loved him to the end and he, was, he did whatever he did and in John you don't find that Jesus was going through any anxiety or any stress but in Matthew, Mark, Luke you see Jesus going through stress and not only this, the funniest thing I'll tell you in, uh, in the synoptic gospels like Matthew, Mark and Luke if you read, how many people came to arrest Jesus? It looks like temple guards temple guards means maximum 10-15 but in Luke, sorry, if you, if you read in John, John says some uh, legions of army, legions of soldiers have come. Legion means 100 people at least. And legions have come. These many people have come. And in fact, Jesus says, Are you should have arrested me when I am outside. You don't have to bring these many people to arrest me. You remember? Here, how many people are coming? Big number of people are coming to arrest Jesus. You know? As if they are arresting someone very huge, man with great power. And in other things, it is normal. And not only that, but they ask, are you the one we are searching for? What happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke? Jesus, yes, and they arrest him and take. And what happens in John? Jesus says, I am. The moment Jesus says, I am, what happens? All these soldiers, they fell to the ground. You know? So what is happening here? I am not saying these people are che cheating or speaking something wrong. What is happening here? John is elevating Jesus. He is speaking high Christology. He, he spoke so much about the divinity of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was there from the beginning. He was, he is, he, he is God himself. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Such a great high high and lifted Christology John was talking throughout the gospel. And after uh, speaking such high Christology, here comes this particular incident, which is very simple, where he wanted to very strongly prove the humanity of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20, Jesus, uh, John wanted to reveal the humanity of Jesus Christ. He said, John 1, uh, 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he did, he, he had shown all these great things, of the miracles Jesus performed, the signs Jesus performed, and then Jesus stopping the storm, all these great things he, he explained. Or, uh, he explained. And then at the last, again he is explaining. And he wanted to tell him, what I said in John 1.14 is not a lie, it is true. The word truly became flesh and dwelt among us. What is the proof? He died on the cross, number one. And he rose again from the dead. And you know what? 
he rose again from the dead with the nail prints which means the jesus christ has risen from the dead bodily you know what are the five fundamentals of christian belief the inspiration of the scripture virgin birth of <coughs> jesus christ and uh, substitutionary atonement of jesus death of jesus christ and bodily resurrection of jesus christ don't ever forget the resurrection of jesus is not just any kind of resurrection but the bodily resurrection of jesus christ why because jesus truly has become a human and he did not cease to be a human after his resurrection but he remained as a human after his resurrection as apostle paul reminds us uh, in the epistle to the timothy there is only one god and one mediator between god and man who is that no the man jesus christ there is only one god and one man between man between god and man there is only one mediator that is man jesus christ the man is sitting in heaven he has taken humanity a flesh like you and me and of course it's glorified and he is sitting there so through this very incident jesus or john he wants to highlight the humanity of jesus christ till now he spoke high christology now he is speaking about high and lifted humanity of jesus christ previously he spoke about high and lifted divinity of jesus now he is lifting up humanity of uh, jesus christ and where is he taking the humanity being seated in the heavenly places he is elevating now again he is not elevating the divinity of jesus now he is elevating the humanity of jesus which conquered the grave and which conquered all the enemies and which conquered all the kingdoms in order to explain that john he purposefully used all these narratives to explain the bodily resurrection of jesus everywhere john speaks about christology but in john 20 he speaks about true humanity of jesus christ and john's desire is to reveal the true nature of jesus christ which he mentioned in john 114 the word became flesh and dwelt among us and uh, uh, in john 114 he declared that and in john 20 he provided the proofs to that and in 1 john chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 he again he proclaimed it john 114 he said the word became flesh and dwelt among us okay it is not a some theological philosophical statement it is a true statement the true word of god god himself he became a flesh like you and me i wanted to stress this word because i wanted to understand the gravity of it it is so very important for the christian faith and christian living and in john 20 he explains the word became flesh and it is the proof what is the proof after resurrection also he remained the flesh thomas put his fingers disciples put their fingers in the nail prints of jesus or the side of jesus christ that is the proof because of that we can strongly believe the word truly became flesh and he remained as flesh that is the proof and then he is proclaiming what is he proclaiming in 1 john chapter 1 verse 1 to uh, chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 that which was from the beginning and which which was which we have heard which we have seen with our own eyes which we have looked upon which our hands have handled concerning the word of life that the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ he is how many times he is using the word what we have seen what we have looked upon what is he talking about <coughs> of course he is talking about incarnation and much more louder towards what they have heard what they touched what did they touch the resurrected jesus when jesus was not resurrected if they have touched every human had life right it would have been a normal statement i touched uh, um, you know someone and 
they are alive. They have life. That would be a normal statement. But these people, they have touched somebody who is dead. And he is still alive. That is where they are saying, this is a special life. This is not like the regular life you and I uh, have. And the regular life you and I see. And regular life you and I, I can imagine. Can you imagine life <coughs> of somebody who already passed away? <coughs> no. How could they say it is something eternal life if it is just like you and my life? No. It is the resurrected life that they have touched. They have seen. They heard. That is the reason John could say the eternal life we have touched and the same thing we have proclaimed to you. Can you see the connection? John 1, 14, John 20 and 1 John chapter 1 verse uh, 1, 2, 3. Through which John wanted to preach that Jesus is the true son of God and he became flesh and he is a true man. Jesus is a truly, Jesus is true God and true man. And it is strongly teaching about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, when John wrote the Gospels, there was docetism which was spreading among the Christian communities. That is the reason he was so very compelled to write the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is docetism? Docetism is a heresy in the early church which says Jesus appeared as a human but he was not a true human. Jesus shape and, uh, and things are like human. But he is not truly really human. And he is someone like ghost. <laughs> like he doesn't have a true body. He appears. But truly he doesn't have body. Why he should not have body? Because Gnostics believe from the, in which who are influenced by the Greek philosophy. All the matter is evil. So all the flesh is evil. So God cannot have evil thing upon him. So if you want him to be God. He should not have body. So he appeared as a body. They came to the some kind of middle ground and they said he appeared as a human but he is not truly really human. That was spreading. That is the reason John was so compelled to write about these uh, events, not just one. Totally six events he has mentioned. Can you understand the importance of the bodily resurrection of Jesus? And the same thing he mentioned in First John chapter 4 verse 2 to 3. By this you know that spirit of God Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Whoever believes the Lord Jesus Christ, God, the word became flesh. Truly he became flesh. Not in concept, but truly he became flesh and we experience it. They are having the spirit of God and whoever denies it, they, have, they are having the spirit of Antichrist. And uh, the unfortunate thing is, Many a times the church, uh, I'm talking about many Christians, they consider the resurrection of Jesus as some kind of spiritual event. But it is not just a spiritual event, my brethren. We have to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ is truly a true event that happened. Jesus rose again from the dead in the flesh. And making it a spiritual event, we are domesticizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ itself. We are domesticizing the gospel itself. We are domesticizing the power of Christianity. Jesus rose again from the dead in the flesh. That is the main thing John wanted to communicate to us. Because in his time, there are the heresies growing. And the second point is about faith by seeing or faith without seeing. That is an important thing we have to uh, focus here. In John chapter 20 verse 29, this is the main words that made, uh, that brought this question in front of us, which is more uh, important, which is great, faith by seeing or faith without uh, seeing. In John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Because, uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And because of this single words we made Thomas as doubting Thomas. Okay. If you read Bible, just there will be some footnotes. Okay, please go to the footnotes, and we find that here it is not Thomas. The word Thomas is not there. Jesus was speaking to the disciples basically, and he is telling disciples, "You have seen me and believed." 
So, is Peter doubting Peter? Is th- if Thomas becomes a doubting Thomas, is Peter doubting Peter? <laughs> is Thomas becomes a doubting Thomas? Is John dou- jo- doubting John? Yes. We, here the statement is not just refl- related to Thomas. It is related to all the disciples. And even the disciples, they believed in Jesus by seeing uh, Jesus only. Okay. They, Jesus appeared to them last week. That's why they believed. Thomas was not there. That is not normal. He did not believe because of that. They have seen. They are not having something great faith. Oh, the moment Jesus said these words, Peter can say, that's why I told you someone, my, some, uh, Thomas, my faith is better than yours. You have put your fingers in Jesus' nails and believed. See, I did not see him and believed. <laughs> no, there is nothing like that. All of them are, are on the same ground. All the disciples have seen him and then only they believed. And if anyone who believed in the resurrection of Jesus were Pharisees and Sadducees, not the disciples. <laughs> they were scared this man will come to life. And uh, gee, they, these disciples were not even bothered about what Jesus said about raising again from the dead. And we think Martha, sorry, Mary Magdalene was so faithful lady who went to see Jesus. She had faith. Oh, she did not go to um, uh, go to the tomb to say hi, Jesus, good morning. But he went. She went to anoint his body with the perfumes. <laughs> so is it faith? None of them have a thought that he would raise him from the dead. <laughs> they might have cried enough and uh, slept uh, in the tiredness. But just by taking Thomas, saying him, doubting Thomas, is not faith. So if Thomas becomes a doubting Thomas, Peter becomes doubting Peter. Okay. So having said that, there is an inseparable connection between the seeing and believing, uh, believing event and the proclamation of the reality of Jesus' resurrection uh, and his true undeniable nature, that is, he is both God and man. In seeing and believing, they understood the true nature of Jesus Christ. It, re- it reveals about the nature of Jesus Christ. This is not an event where Jesus is disappointed by the unbelief of Thomas or the disciples. As Manova also mentioned, uh, Jesus was not disappointed at this point of time. In other places in the Gospels, we can find, um, O oh, you of little faith. These are the words Jesus used. Uh, and here he doesn't use any of those statements. Jesus knows it is very difficult for them to believe and he wants to come and he express, He wants to reveal uh, himself to them so that uh, they may grow in their faith. And another thing let me tell you, I asked the question which is great? Is believing without seeing is great or believing by seeing is great? And uh, 60% of them have said believing without seeing is greater than Believing by seeing. Otherwise, believing blindly Jesus without knowing any, doing any research is greater than believing in Jesus after doing all your researches and believing in those research. The reality is both are same. There is nothing great. Believing in Jesus without seeing is not greater than believing in Jesus by seeing because faith is a gift. Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 what said you have been saved by grace through faith and it is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Whether it is buying by seeing or not seeing your faith is a gift of God. So what do you have to boast about? Hmm? Whether you are seeing or not seeing the faith is a gift of God. So there is, the question itself is wrong. But unfortunately in the Christian realm we have taken that and many a times we have been um, uh, abused and misused the scripture and the people uh, have been shunned. If It may not be about the resurrection of Jesus or fundamental faiths of Jesus. If you have a problem and you expressed a doubt and they may they immediately what people say, you could not have faith. Because you don't have faith nothing good is happening in your life. Because you are speaking negative all negative things are happening. Okay, and you should have a simple faith, simple mustard seed faith. 
and you know what mustard seed faith is the most difficult faith to have in this world none of us can produce the mustard seed faith because faith is a gift of god it is not something you or i can produce by you know what by using these statements are we not uh, uh, troubling our brethren are we not disappointing and uh, they are becoming stumbling block in their spiritual growth yes we or we should not be proud about our faith or we should not look down at others who are struggling with faith because faith is a gift of god if you have a doubt it's okay come to the foot of jesus he is willing to reveal it to you just as he did to thomas this state in this statement jesus was not telling people believing without seeing is greater than believing by seeing that is not what he said just taking one incident we cannot change the entire concept the bible speaks this is the it has a different uh, purpose and that we are going to explore now so there is no no difference between faith that is based on empirical pieces of evidences and simple faith that is not based on visuals or uh, senses or experiments that we do so there is no comparison between these two parts of faith because both are gifts of god faith by seeing is a gift of god faith blind uh, directly believing is a gift of god that's one and the second thing is faith by seeing and believing here in this context it has a different perspective altogether as i told you before when john wrote his gospel that was almost end of first century jesus appeared himself to the disciples and 500 other people and at last to paul as paul said in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 to 7 for i delivered to you first of all that which i also received that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and then he writes and that he was seen by cephas then by 12 after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to present day and some have fallen asleep after that he was seen by james then by all apostles then last of all he, he was seen by me also uh, as by one born out of due time here paul is saying paul he was he was uh, martyred ad 64 that's the middle of the first century okay he is saying jesus died according to the scriptures rose again from the dead according to the scripture he appeared to the disciples and 500 of people james and others also and last he was seen by me and most of the people who have seen jesus risen jesus physically they are still there some have fallen asleep some still there that was paul's time so he was giving that gave what the uh, testimony apostles are giving is the eye witness of the bodily resurrection of jesus christ and and the, all these people they have believed jesus because they are the eye witnesses and they shared the testimony other started believing and that's how churches were forming but when the time of john has come most of this generation they have passed away john was the last apostle who died and most of the and he was the youngest man youngest disciple of jesus christ okay so prob most probably most of the people have died so when john wrote the gospel most of the eyewitnesses of jesus and his resurrection were no more and the church is with full of new generation of believers all these new generation of believers they have not seen jesus they just heard the witness of the disciples and they believed in jesus now you look people who have seen are the disciples people who have believed the first generation christians on were still today are the people who believed in the witness of the eye witnesses that are jesus disciples of jesus christ it is talking about that it is not talking about every day life where you you are believing in god by seeing or not seeing and with that let us not do the spiritual abuse 
it is not talking about that it is talking about the disciples who have seen jesus physically and it is talking about all of us who believed in their witness and uh, at that time as i said docetism was growing because of that very reason john has to write all these things and stress and he has to do that here people who believed after seeing jesus are all the apostles and others and the new generation are the people who believed not seeing but based on the witness of apostles and now that is the same thing now john is writing now we read first john chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 how it makes sense that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our own eyes which we have looked upon and our eyes have handled concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was uh, with the father was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you we are eye witnesses we are declaring that message to you and you also uh, we are declaring it to you so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship with the is with the father and his son jesus christ that is what the context of this statement so similar statements are and the uh, and next thing we can see is there are uh, similar statements like john chapter 20 verse 29 which we read just now blessed are those who believe without seeing and uh, one more is john chapter 1 verse 15 john chapter 1 verse 50 what happened was uh, jesus was coming and he saw philip uh, he called philip and uh, he said that i have seen you sitting under the fig tree and he said oh you are the true messiah then jesus said oh jesus answered and said to him because i said to you i saw you under the fig tree you believe you will see greater things than these these and john 20 they are similar i have because i have seen you or because you have seen me you are believing but let me tell you blessed are those who see me without believe me who without seeing that is a statement and another thing is you are going to see something greater than what we have seen the second part of this statement is a statement of encouragement to all this new generation christians apart from john and others even to us this is an encourage words of encouragement to uh, all of us and not only this is not a prophetic or judgment of jesus to say people those who saw and believed are lesser than people who believe without seeing it is saying there is a joy blessedness is about joy and happiness for the people who believed in jesus even without seeing there is a greater joy in their hearts directly god is pouring out into their hearts that is what jesus is talking blessed okay that is the reason john included the thomas incidents with its concluding beatitude obviously to encourage all those people of the present and of the future who had believed in the lord without seeing him and what would be more encouraging than a beatitude coming from the mouth of the lord coming from the mouth of the risen lord listening those words itself is such a blessedness so that's what jesus spoke so the and the same blessedness is explained by peter in first peter chapter 1 verse 8 we can see uh, peter says without having seen him you love him though you do not sorry though you do not now see him you believe in him and rejoice with joy unutterable and full of glory that is the different that is the explanation for what jesus said to thomas we should not use those words to shun people about not for saying not having faith and as a with that you read first john chapter 1 verse 4 it says and these things we write to you so that your joy may be full so when we believe in jesus without seeing there is a great joy that directly comes into our heart which jesus said and which apostle peter said which apostle paul also sorry john also saying believing in jesus always has great joy believing without seeing is like enjoying the sorry for the analogy but believing in jesus without seeing is like enjoying the intoxication even without sipping the wine that's what john is 
writing here. And that's the reason I was so very happy to hear the singing, the song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Suddenly, how this song came, I was just wondering. It is part of my sermon, how the song came. I believe it's the Spirit of God who led all of us. And uh, uh, there is a great joy in believing in Him without seeing. That's what it's in mind. So, believing after seeing the risen Jesus is a way of believing. And God respects that it's a gift of God. And... Uh, uh, so, believing after seeing the risen Christ was a way, it was limited only to the apostolic generation. It is not about us. It is limited to only apostolic generation. So, uh, in this incident, John subtly and powerfully projected another way of believing in Jesus and namely the way of believing without previously seeing. And more specifically, of believing on the basis of the testimony of the apostolic eyewitness. All of us were believing in Jesus on the based on the witness of apostles. So, let us hold on to our faith which has been handed over to us by the apostles and faithful witness of the church looking unto Jesus never forgetting, looking unto Jesus who is the author of our faith and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who gives us the faith. He is the one who sustains our faith and who brings growth in our Faith. That is what the incident of Thomas teaches us. May God bless you.